How, so how long have you been in Berlin? Uh, I've been here for about five and a half years. And what, why the move here? Where were you? Um, I lived on, in Victoria on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. And I was a dishwasher for a while there. That wasn't really working out for me. I thought I needed a career change. Mm -hmm. um, my brother moved here and I was going to follow him a year later. Um, but it didn't work out with um, some tour stuff that was kind of going to fund my move. And so I put it off. But the original idea, basically to move to Berlin as specifically was because my brother moved here. Mm. So it was kind of to be closer to him as well as um, instead of moving here that, uh, or that first year, um, I came for a month and it was just when I got back to Canada, I realized it wasn't really possible for me to stay there anymore. Mm. Um, I love it. I love the people. It's beautiful. But as a career, as a home base for career, it doesn't really work. So where did you, when did you start making music? Were you already making music in? Um, when we were kids, like I think maybe when I was about eight, my mom put us in piano lessons. And instead of having a piano, some kind of beat up thing or whatever Casio that we probably could have practiced on as an eight year old and a 10 year old, my dad got us this um, full weighted um, MIDI keyboard with a general sound bank and two track MIDI recorder. Mm. Um, so at a very early age, we thought that that was normal to know how to merge MIDI and all that sort of thing. Um, I mean, the music that we were making back then was not anything I would release or probably show anybody now. I mean, sadly, the, the cassettes that, or the discs that they're all saved on are quite obsolete. So I... Um, I don't even know where I'd find that to play it anymore, but uh, it was very basic, but still like toys. That, that was a, that was our toy. This uh, like I don't know, probably like a four thousand dollar MIDI keyboard. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess it's kind of funny because I think I mean we heard I heard electronic music in soundtracks like Beverly Hills Cop and Break In and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess I heard some craft work and all that, but I didn't really understand the difference between that and any other kind of music. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like we were kind of already in it by the time we realized what electronic music was and all of that sort of thing. And what were your early influences other than Beverly Hills Cop? And <laughs> um, I think uh, I... Some early stuff. I, I mean, I really love uh, Vangelis, and uh, I mean, the Chariots Fire soundtrack is pretty amazing. Or like, I think he did Blade Runner as well. When you first started making music, what was your? I mean, post post the MIDI keyboard, what was your first say door music software? Um, the first me. Well, okay, yeah. So we got a computer um eventually and we hooked the keyboard up to that and i think we used power tracks pro okay. um and i think it was originally in dos and it was a pain in the ass <laughs> um and yeah the same 120 728 sounds yeah um and i don't think it was until about 97 or 8 that i got a my own computer and um, I started making music with, I guess, like Rebirth and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you got some old bits of kit, you got some classic Roland, got a 707 in the back there. Yeah, the 707 I've had for a while, it's, you can see it's beat up. Yeah, they normally are. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, I got that for, I think, 75 bucks or something like that. Yeah. And then you got a, what, Electron? Yeah, Octatrack, yeah. yeah. Um, I started buying these, uh, this company I really like, the Vermona. Okay, yeah. Um, a lot of it, I, I mean, I really like it because it's all very um, hands-on. Everything's there yeah. as a control. I mean, like this thing, the JD-800 is yeah. a spaceship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, you don't really see anything that, uh, I'm not really a big fan of anything that I have to like scroll through a screen. I mean, that's what the computer's for. Yeah, right. Um, 
but uh, yeah, so I started using Rebirth and that sort of like whatever cheapy kind of uh, not super professional mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, Soundforge. So mm -hmm. I'd sit there with a calculator, mm -hmm. figuring out how long every sample needed to be. Mm -hmm. Um, copying and pasting and all that sort of thing and it's kind of funny because um, I mean my brother did the same thing we really recognized that sound because um, you can't do any mixing after you've pasted one thing you can't paste another thing and then change the volume of the first thing you've dropped on there mm -hmm. um, so you're kind of left with this I mean, it's very difficult to get a good mix out of that anyway. Mm. Um, but when I heard, I think it was Burial's first album, mm. I remember listening to it and thinking, like, this sounds like kind of how I was mixing my music. And I found out later that he was doing it in Soundforge. Okay. It was actually the same uh, technique, apparently. Right. Um, I mean, it's a great program. It's just not a multi-band or not multi-channel uh it's not a DAW or yeah I find um, I, yeah I've often, often spoken to artists and people that are producing to a high level and you find out they were using very basic programs back then I mean uh, obviously Reason's very comprehensive now but I think Prodigy used to do a lot yeah. of their stuff on Reason when it was back in its yeah, early for stages sure. you know and, and obviously you can do a lot with MIDI but um but yeah and Fruity Loops I was uh, again, that's also now FL Studio, this big... I know people software. who are still using Fruity Loops yeah, and making yeah. like pretty crazy music with it. Yeah. Um, who are quite successful with it. I think it's kind of seen as this amateur toyish kind of software, but I think it's... Just, I mean, the, just the name Fruity Loops. Yeah. You know, it just seems like silly. Yeah. But it's... Uh, no, FL Studio, I, I think that's one of the most popular music software programs now. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's right up there. Wow, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, but sec well, along with Ableton Live, which is what, what you use as your main... Yeah, I, uh, yeah I, after Soundforge, I went to uh, um, Acid, and then uh, from there I went to Ableton. I think I transferred to this, um, maybe version 3. So, there's quite a prominence of uh, sequences, step sequences with the... With the with the Roland, with the Electron, I can see a few others kicking around as well. Would you say this is, um, is that sort of the, the, the way you started thinking of music and now it's creating music by using step sequences to build up layers? Well, actually, uh, I mean, my brother got into the hardware a lot earlier. Um, he got a job so he could afford to buy all that stuff. Um, and. I really use the computer a lot more. Um, it's it's kind of a later thing that I've gotten into. I mean, the the Electron, uh, the Octatrack is just so powerful and it can do things that I can't do with Ableton. Um, I, so I really like that. Um, it's hard for me to incorporate that though into the music. I mean, it, I find that I use it as like a toy more I jam around on it and I mean I go in the studio with my brother and we'll record things for whatever hours and it's it's we're just writing music it's not necessarily for the purpose of releasing it's just this kind of expression mm -hmm. um, but I'm slowly getting into it more and I, I mean I've just been able to s start setting it up properly I just moved here and then um, just getting getting it all laid out properly, I guess, so that I can start incorporating it. I think um, with the external instrument plugin with Ableton, yeah. it helps a lot. Yeah. Being able to have it like very integrated into the software like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think writing with the step sequencers, though, I think it, my, my brain just works so much better with the piano roll in Ableton being able to visualize and see everything that's happening like very quickly. Mm. Um, I guess the, the, this thing that I, that I was going to show you here, um, one of the problems that I was having was with key changes, I couldn't see all of the key changes at the same time. So if you're editing one MIDI clip, mm. you have to go, okay, on bar eight, it goes to 
A and then whatever bar 15 it goes to C and so on. And so you're kind of jumping between MIDI clips to see that and you have to kind of remember, okay, now I'm writing in this, now I'm writing in this. And so this thing that I made here was, I just made this last week actually, and it's kind of an attempt at visualizing all of it at the same time. Should um, take a look at that now? Yeah. So we have three kind of groups here, mm -hmm. group tracks, and you can see on the left-hand side. I wonder if it's too close to actually focus on it, or just about. So you can see on the left-hand side here, we have kind of a piano roll along the group by the colored tracks. Mm -hmm. And so that is your notes going up and down. And then across in each track is a 16th note of eight notes. So it's a half bar sequence. So if you play so that... Each one of those is a clip, but it only has one note in, you know, one part of that bar, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So the first, all of the ones, all of the clips in the first track, there's yeah. a, that note Just corresponding that. at yeah. the beginning. And then the second, it's the so next 16th along. note. Cool. So if I, if I can play that for you, I can show you what the one sequence is doing. All right, so this, if I press play now, this will play. I can... So you can see the track's triggering there. You choose the note you want to play by picking the clip on the track, and then you turn the, that note on and off, or turn that step on and off using the mute switches just below. Yeah, exactly, you can see it, the MIDI going across. It's really cool. It's a really interesting way of using live. I've, I've certainly never seen it used like that before. Um, and then the key changes are happening over here in this other section. So it's each one of these groups is one bar. And so the sequence you're hearing right now is going through this. And you choose the same way, the piano roll, which notes you want it to play, or which key you want it in. And then that's being... Um, shifted up or down to yeah transposed up or down depending on where you want it so if we go to the third bar in it is here very confusing yes. so if you look here at the third bar it shifts up shifts to up f so that's it's so pitch shifting all of it up five so half tones you just you, yeah you choose a clip to choose where or rather, the, the pitch shifter is automated to choose how it yeah, changes, exactly. the whole sequence, right? So the, this is essentially a, a step sequencer as well. After I explain that I don't like step sequencers, <laughs> yes. I, I build this step sequencer. So they're in groups here so that I can shift them also um, as like a master. That was a suggestion I had from my friend Noah Pred yeah. to make things a little less confusing. Um, and so that's the one sequence of the lead. And so we can add the bass and the pads. So you can have, at the same time, I've written an eight bar melody that was all in C minor. Um, but if you just played that over that melody, of course, because there's key changes happening through the whole thing, it wouldn't, it would be out of key at times. Every two or four bars, it would be out of key. So 
if I have that going through the transposition as well, then it all works out. So you can hear, oops, you can hear that happening here. So I guess um, I kind of learn how to make music or I, I mean one of the parts of one of the things that I enjoy the most about making music is uh, coming up with an idea like that and seeing if it will work and then trying to incorporate that somehow into uh, a song for other people to listen to or even just for my own purposes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of my music has been experimenting and I think lately it might not, I'm not sure if it's as evident. I, I know that my first releases were, it was quite obvious that I was experimenting. It's very choppy and lots of edits and it's kind of all of that is right up front in your face uh, through most of my music and it's slowly kind of it seems like it's taken a back seat, but it's still right up front. It's just um, much more fine-tuned, I guess, now. Whereas this looks very strange, I think, um, when you listen to it, if you don't know how it's being made, it's you're not going to be hearing the process, kind of. I guess with the old music where it's very, like, kind of IDM-y, glitchy, you're, you're very conscious of the fact that it's very weird and technical and you can kind of imagine how it's being made when you listen to that style of music. Mm. Um, this is maybe a more subtle, but still very nerdy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, I think you're right. I think it's, it's really cool to find new and original ways of using equipment, software and everything to, to, to make music. And the way you're using that there is, it's very cool, very interesting. So what's the session we've got here? Well, this is uh, a similar kind of concept with the melodic sequencer. It's um, a half bar um, and by using, can you see the screen there? The screen. Okay. <laughs> um, so it originally started off with, um, you can see the, I'm not sure if you can see that close up, but each one of these scale uh, MIDI effects this is called Q, this is A, this is Z, this is Q, A, Z. So the original concept was to be able to press the keys um, and then alternatively shift with the keys and it would shut off. So you can see if I push Q, it shuts this scale on and off. Um, and what's, what it's doing is it's letting through the stacked uh, MIDI. So on each step that it plays each drum sound as you go along. In the same way that we had the notes before, now it's just it's triggering a drum. Exactly, yeah. So, And then I set it up with push so that it would be a little bit easier. So when I turn the lights off, then it'll play the, the corresponding drums in that uh, place, as well as mutes for each channel, um, which are the eight steps. It kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like a little techno beat machine. Um, so I just have a kick and a clap bass there, and then you can kind of just... make little, uh, little grooves. Um, and, then it, and then it also has uh, each drum routed through um, its own channel here. So you kind of have a matrix of sends where you can go to reverb, chorus, delay, uh, vocoder, or flanger. So as you kind of turn these up, you can have a little bit of fun. So Thank you. 
Um, and I was uh, talking to a friend of mine. He's um, he's in a few different groups. Uh, the first one the, he's in uh, Inkwell. He did a remix for me on Wagon Repair quite a few years ago. Ryan Tran. He said that uh, he didn't like how rigid the step sequences were. So I decided that I would add some shuffles. So then each second step is moved over um, gradually as you go down. See, so there's different different amounts of shuffle. So you get a nice kind of like housey kind of vibe, swing. To the point where it's uh, almost train wrecking. <laughs> And then he said, uh, well, that's all fine, but you still have this rigid swing. So, you know, everything is still in, everything is swung in a very natural way. So now um, you can have the swing at different amounts. So this one here will be swung the most. This is swung about halfway and that one swung not at all. So you can get these. Oh, yeah non-traditional swing you can have it kind of stressed and swung wherever you want it to be um, and he said still again that's fine but they're still stuck there and so with the action follow I decided that I would make it so that they move around so every two bars they switch <laughs> to a close uh, one of the close shuffles on either side of it so every two bars it, it switches to I guess uh, the one thing that's good about that is to have the kick and the snare still straight, otherwise it starts getting really messy. Yeah. This thing is amazing. This has changed my life. Yeah. Instead of from the gone from the clicking every note into being able to sequence it with this, yeah. um, everyone who uses Ableton should get one, I think. Um, when I'm in the studio with my brother, we have um, an Ableton project open mm -hmm. uh, with all the MIDI routed so that we can control all of his equipment mm -hmm. and I sit there and I sequence everything from the push um, and I don't look at the computer it's very rare that I need to look up at the computer to change something um, and it's always so deep in a menu that I would never want that to be buried somewhere in the controller anyway it would just make it way too complicated it's just enough it's the perfect kind of balance of complex and simplicity. Um, so you can just get your ideas out very quickly. Yeah, I don't work for Ableton. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been releasing, um, the majority of my records came out on Wagon Repair, which was my brother's label. And um, over the last two years, I've been releasing on, I did two EPs for Rinse. Um, which is the Rinse FM's record label. Um, I'm in the works on another EP for them as well. Um, and there is talk of doing another album at some point. I haven't done an album since 2010 on Wagon Repair, but I'm itching for that a little bit. Here's a question. Um, do you feel that, because uh, I've never made an album, I've always just made singles and uh, I sort of have this burning desire to make an album. I feel like you're not really a musician until you make an album. Would you agree with that? What do you? Uh, um, I don't think that you need to release music to be a musician. Well, that's, yeah, that's a whole other point. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think uh, anyone who is making music is a musician. I don't think there's any kind of um, judgment. I don't know what the the commercial world sees or how they would see that. Yeah. But 
No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you can get a huge amount of enjoyment as a musician just doing stuff yourself at home. You yeah. don't even have to. But well, if, it, if I, I mean, if I, and I don't even have all my music on here, but if I search for Hard Vision in my iTunes, there is there's probably over 800 songs in there. It would take you maybe three days to get through all of it, and you'd, your mental stability would be questionable by the end of it, <laughs> I think. Um, but yeah, I think um, I don't. I'm not a believer that art needs to be seen by an audience to be art. I think it's making it for yourself is just as valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with the album, so what's nice is if you are always making singles, I you can't always put that weirdo song on the record. Mm. Like if you're making a if you're making an EP for the club. Mm. They don't want to have like an ambient tune on the B side or whatever. So it's it's nice. It's a nice place to be able to put all that music that you've been working on that uh, doesn't fit on those disco yeah, right. maxi singles. Yeah. Um, I think the 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 album that I did for Wagner Pair it's got quite a bit of obscure music on there. It's very strange. There's a couple dance things as well that. Um, yeah, it's not, I mean, also being able to, I mean, if you get caught up in the single thing, um, you know, you have this, you start writing singles. And I think as an artist, it's not necessarily the, the healthiest thing. I think it's always good to be experimenting and mm -hmm. making those songs that aren't necessarily just for people on the dance floor to freak out to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there might be an album coming one day. <laughs> I think I've been saying that for the last two years now. <laughs> so this is a video game that I made in Ableton Live using only MIDI clips, and it's played on the Ableton Push. Wicked, let's, let's check it out. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 